Good afternoon and welcome to this online conversation. We're glad that you have joined us. This is the fifth and final conversation in our summer webinar series that we've been calling Everyday Faith, Possibilities, Limits, and Callings. My name is Noel Snyder and I'm a program manager here at the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship. And I'm so grateful to have as my conversation partner today, Dr. Jeremy Begbie. Dr. Begby is one of the best known voices in the field of theology and the arts. He is the Thomas A. Langford a Distinguished Research Professor of Theology at Duke, University, uh, Duke Divinity School, and he also serves as the Director of Duke Initiatives in Theology and the Arts. He has published many books on theology and music uh, that I have learned so much from, uh, including some of the, the better known ones uh, are uh, Theology, Music, and Time, Resounding Truth, Music, Modernity, and God, and uh, Peculiar Orthodoxy. Dr. Begbie lect lectures and performs music widely, often uh, doing so at the same time, uh, lecturing and performing music. He is an ordained minister in the Church of England and has served in parish ministry as well. Jeremy, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon and for sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you. Delight to be here. And um, I don't know how many or who exactly are listening in, but, but thank you for, for joining us for this. So uh, we're talking today about music and language in worship. And uh, we're the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship, so it's obvious why we would be interested in this topic. I'm, I'm wondering if you would share a little bit about your own background and why you became interested in this topic. Sure. Um, I came to faith when I was about 19, when I was at university through a friendship, a close friendship. And up until that point, I think it's fair to say I felt much more at home in the world of music than I did in the world of language. Um, music did for me, I thought, you know, what any self-respecting religion ought to do. It gave me a social life and uh, a reason for getting up in the morning, terrific emotional experience, lots of friends, and a career indeed. I was set in a career in music at that time and had done a lot of performing and competing and all those things. On coming to faith, of course, I started to read scripture and um, fairly soon felt a call to ordination of all things, which involves a lot of speaking. And up until that time, really, I was very nervous about speaking in, in public. Uh, I never said a word in class in high school or anything like that. I kept absolutely silent in any kind of discussion groups. I've, I could play in front of hundreds, but I couldn't, I was fr frozen if, if, I, if I tried to speak. Um, but I, then I realized I'm going to have to do a lot of speaking. And in parish ministry, of course, I was thrown into preaching virtually every Sunday. And I then realized um, that I was having to combine these two wonderful media. Uh, I was a musician and I thought like a musician, but I was also one who had to craft words. And so as I developed in the theology and music world and the theology and arts world, and I, I soon... Uh, I soon felt pulled in two directions by the kind of people that I was meeting, particularly in, in theology of worship and, and those areas. Not, I'm sure this doesn't happen at Calvin, but I mean, to caricature it, on the one side, you've got a sort of word-obsessed Protestantism. Uh, if you can't say it, it's not going to reveal anything except your own feelings. You must be able to say it, and preferably in statements. Uh, and preferably all beginning with the same letter, if you're a preacher as well. The sermon is everything. Prayers uh, will tend to be verbose in this worship. Silence is the enemy, or at least hell, the deep fear of, of stopping. I was at a speaking at a clergy conference not so long ago when I, in, in Texas of all places, and I was criticized roundly afterwards for pausing regularly between the prayers. So it's like, Kind of, um, but you've just got to keep saying it. You've simply got to keep saying it. Music will need to be kept in check by words, and it needs to be explained by words if, if you're not actually singing a text. Now, the great point the, behind all that, the good thing about all that is, of course, the keenness to be faithful to Scripture, the keenness to take language seriously, which we must do in the Christian faith. 
Um, that's on the one side. The other side, let's call it a kind of aestheticism, where language is the enemy in worship. If you have to speak, well, so be it. If we've got to have a sermon, well, I suppose so. But it's when the music starts up that things really happen. So a friend of mine used to say to me, for me, Jeremy, the real presence is in the music. And language is seen basically as a hindrance in worship, as a kind of, well, if you have to, kind of necessary evil. But the sooner you can get away from language, the better. And I'm caricaturing you. No, no one's going to quite put it like that. Uh, but the good point about that is people have seen that music does its own kind of work in its own kind of way that it isn't just a function of something else. It is a unique medium. And if you want to bring all this down to earth, I think you can see it very often in the struggle between pastors and musicians, whether they're worship leaders, choir directors, or whatever. There's a kind of weariness very often. Pastors are often deeply jealous of musicians because uh, musicians can get a congregation weeping uncontrollably, you know, in a matter of minutes. And a good preacher can, but very often a preacher says, gosh, all I've got is words. I, I, I'm virtually tone deaf. I can't play the piano and I not sing very well, whatever. I've just got these kind of bare words. The musician on the hand looks at the preacher and says, well, gosh, they've got a lot of control over running this church or whatever. Uh, they've, they've only got words. And this preacher never understands me, the musician, or how difficult it is to produce music or whatever. So there's this kind of tussle. And I think... A, Deep down, a lot of those tussles are about this kind of tension that many feel between music and language, and which I've have felt really right through my through my life. So I've been trying to uh, bring these, as you can guess, bring these two together, uh, which we can talk more about uh, soon. But does that ring any bells on the on the kind of tensions I'm talking about? Oh, it sure does. Yeah, and um, especially as someone who's a musician, and my primary area of study is preaching. Um, yeah. yeah, bringing those two worlds together is uh, not often an easy uh, task. When I'm asked to go and do a kind of musical theology presentation, uh, they say, well, could you do that in worship? And could you play the piano? I said, yeah, okay. I said, but obviously you won't want to preach, will you? <laughs> it's very interesting that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, on the contrary, I will preach. If, if you invite me, I would really very much like to preach as well, because I believe both of these media are incredibly important for the church. Yeah. Well, and I wonder also, just as you were speaking and telling a little bit about your own background, if, um, especially once you you yourself got more comfortable with language and... Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, yeah. But, but I've, I had to work at it. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't come naturally at all. Um <laughs> and I had to work at overcoming a huge fear of speaking in public as well. Mm -hmm. So I had to get over this idea that I could only communicate in music, as it were, in public or with large groups. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I did. But it was very, very hard. And preaching was the thing that I was most nervous about, most worried about, spent most time on by far. And I don't, re I don't regret that, but, but it was a struggle. Mm -hmm. I say this for any preachers out there or would-be <laughs> preachers. If you're still nervous, if you're still very nervous before praying sermon, that's an excellent thing. Yeah. If, if you that, if you stop being nervous, something is seriously wrong. If you if you stop thinking you need to work at it, you're in the wrong job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that applies to musicians as well. Of course, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's uh, something that uh, those two fields, I'm sure, can contribute to each other. Yeah. Definitely. I, I, the music, it's just that the music came much more naturally to me. Yeah. I had to work at it, but it was just in my kind of bloodstream. Yeah. So you've shared a little bit about sort of this very common dynamic, uh, which can develop in churches between um, musicians or uh, we might, some, some churches might use the language of worship leaders um, and pastors and, or preachers hmm. and how sometimes those two worlds are in competition, um, mm. they struggle to understand each other. Um, so that's a little bit about, do you wanna say anything more though about uh, why you think this is such an important topic uh, for well, the church? I think it's a very important uh, topic for music and worship and for the life of the church generally in worship. And we, we might talk a bit about that 
later on mm -hmm. about you know the practicalities of that. But I think much bigger issues are at stake theologically, and and um, yeah, two in particular come to mind. The first in the form of a question: Can something glorify God in a non-verbal way? Mm -hmm. The heavens declare the glory of God. You know, Psalm 19, um, day after day, they pour forth speech. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out to all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Uh, creation, in this case, the heavens, creation glorifies God in a nonverbal way. We can speak about that, but it's doing its own work of glorifying God in its own created or creational way. Um, now, should we be true to Scripture? Yes, of course, we should be true to Scripture. But can we be faithful to Scripture in a nonverbal way? Mm -hmm. That's that's the kind of extension of the same question. And I think, oh, the answer is obviously yes, but we find that very hard to believe sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so when it comes to music, is it possible for music to glorify God in a musical way, is it possible for music to be faithful to the sermon, to the prayers or whatever in, in worship, in a musical way? Mm -hmm. You don't try to turn it into something else in order for it to glorify God. That's the challenge. And it's a, that's a profound issue. I think the, the ultimate issue, if you're speaking doctrinal, is the doctrine of creation. Do we have a doctrine of creation wide enough, generous enough, big enough? to encompass something that's non-verbal. That's the first big thing. And the other thing is that we just got to come to terms with, and this is going to sound very Protestant, but uh, it's the question of how important is language, human language, to God? Mm -hmm. There's a tendency for us to think, oh, our words are merely human attempts to make some kind of sense of God or of the Christian life. Uh-uh. Not according to the Jewish and Christian tradition. But God has directly involved human beings in his purposes. And that means speaking human beings, history of Israel, the development of scripture, and supremely, of course, in the incarnation, the coming of God as a human being. And people say, well, the word becomes flesh. Yes, speaking flesh. Mm -hmm. It isn't just, it isn't just signal things. <laughs> he spoke, and, and we have much of what he spoke on in public record, so to speak. Uh, the word, became word user and set in motion amongst his followers a whole new way of speaking. Words were being transformed. Language was being renewed along with the rest of us. You know, people talk about you know, the, the renewal of our lives and about our morals and our aims and desires and love. Absolutely right. People say less about the renewal of language, which is so much part of being a human, but is absolutely intrinsic uh, to Christian transformation. You learn how to speak in a new way. You learn how to love people through language mm. and not just speak at them. Uh, language then becomes a vehicle of something very different. Of, of, and, and all these, these words like father, love, God, joy, peace, justice, whatever, are all reformed. They're all going to be remade, reminted through the gospel. So language is very important to God, not just us. But to God, and God has graciously appropriated language, um, or as Calvin used to say, accommodated himself to human capacity, which includes language. And I think uh, what the, the challenge of the music language, we don't want to set music against language as if language was intrinsically the enemy or the impediment. It can go wrong, horribly wrong. It can be horribly distorted. But it's not basically a problem to God. It's a glorious medium that he's given us and that is that is intrinsic but in built into the way that god deals with us there we go mm. yeah it's not like a sermon isn't it? the collection will now be taken <laughs> <laughs> while we play some music uh, thank you exactly yes indeed you are the choir sings just as i am yeah quite <laughs> Uh, so one of the things I love about reading your writing is that it helps me to actually take a step back often and understand what a thing is in a way that I often hadn't even thought to ask. Um, so often what we need is uh, not just 
uh, practical steps about how to do this or that with this or that, but, uh, but even a, a better appreciation for what this or that is, in this case, what music and language are. Mm. So I'm mm. wondering um, if, if it would, uh, if you would be willing uh, to just uh, help us take a step back for a moment and um, tell us how you think about these things. What is music? How would you define it? How, what's language and how would you define it? How, how are they similar and how are they distinct? Yeah, that's about two minutes worth. Oh, I think we can we can get that out of the way fairly quickly. <laughs> sure. Um, right. Well, there will have to be some sweeping generalizations yeah. here because because it's a very, very important question. But bearing in mind, it's also a contentious issue, yeah. how you define music, how you define language, and how you understand the relationship between them. Yeah. Let's, a general comment to begin with, it's going to, a kind of warning. It's often said music is a universal language, as if music is a type of language. Mm. We need to be careful with that. Mm. Why do we need to be careful? Because although they have undoubtedly similarities, they share things in common, uh, we, they also have differences. I'll come to them in a second. Very, very important differences. And also, we need to avoid thinking, well, there's this wonderful thing up here called language. And music is like, like a language that hasn't quite grown up yet. You know, it's on its way to being a proper language and really meaning something. But, you know, it's a kind of fuzzy thing down there. And we live up in the exalted realm of language. See, so you say music is a type of language. You're suggesting it's, it's the subset of something that's much more important. Mm -hmm. Now, what made me rethink that was reading a fair amount about the origins of music and language in human history, as far as we know them. And uh, anthropologists, evolutionists, others have written a huge amount about this. There's considerable disagreement over some details. Uh, there's, the jury is out on a lot of issues, but some things command very widespread support. And I think they're very interesting things. And the basic basic idea is that music and language, as we know them today, uh, share a common root and uh, a very primordial, you might say primitive, basic uh, type of communication, which probably took the form of primitive vocalizations. That is things you do with your voice, like sigh and groan, uh, vocal expressions, um, you might yelp, you might cry out, that these, it appears, were neither quite music and neither quite language. They were what some people call a musy language. And there are all sorts of funny names for it. And there's a fair amount of evidence this. And the, the key things of, about this, this very early form of communication is that it was geared, it appears, most evidence suggests towards social formation and cohesion, that it is about building relations. It is very connected with the body as a whole, not just, although it's vocal, it very, most evidence suggests, as today actually, uh, that it goes with, with bodily movement as well. It is an intrinsically bodily thing and it, that it was strongly emotionally charged. So we've got these primitive vocalizations in the interest of social formation and cohesion, you've got to remember that, uh, and bodily rooted, very, very bodily rooted with a strong emotional tie. It's very, I find it very interesting that there's those things that the Protestants always forget about most things. If you think about it, that just sums up what, um, sadly, a lot of my own evangelical tradition uh, will tend to forget. Now, how does the theory go? Are you with me so far? No, yeah. all right. I am. It, that what the idea is that from that route in time, over a thousand, hundreds of thousands of years, these two not went their separate ways, but went their distinct ways, leading to, on the one hand, what we would now recognize as music. That is where you have, most people would understand music as discrete tones or notes, pitches, organized around rhythmic patterns. Uh, and on the other side, language, which includes, uh, of course, words, phrases, sentences. And what this picture does, it enables us to see both the similarities and the differences between music and language. Both music and language are, in, are involved with the body. Any linguist that will tell you that now, it's not just a matter of mind and mouth, 
it's you, you, a language evolves from our bodily relation to the world. I can't go into all that, but I have to take my word for it. That it's social through and through, both are social. And we might say, we might add also both a means of coming to terms with the physical environment we inhabit as bodily creatures. Now that's the kind of, those are the basic similarities because they come from the same root. Now for the differences, and here it gets particularly interesting. Music, it appears, is a especially significant in creating emotional bonds between people. And it can give these bonds a kind of emotional electricity far beyond the powers of language. Yes, of course, language can unite people emotionally as well. And just think of the, the orator at, a, at a, a rally or whatever. Although please notice also at a rally, you'll probably sing and there'll probably be music as well. Uh, music, what I'm, the point is, is, is a very powerful way of helping us re read and resonate with the emotional state of another. An example I often use, I mean, there are hundreds of examples. You, people listening to this, I hope, will know, will instantly know what I'm speaking about if you sing with others in a group or in a choir, even if you sing in unison. But a lovely example came from a, an instrumentalist in the East-West Divan Orchestra, which is an orchestra made up of young um, Israelis and Palestinians that's conducted by Daniel Barenboim. And he brought these together, people who could barely speak to each other and who held each other at considerable distance in every conceivable way. Here they are playing music. And one of the cellists was interviewed about the experience. She said, it's very hard to demonize someone you've just played Tchaikovsky with. Hmm. This is a lovely way of putting it. You see, he, she found it very hard to speak to the person playing next to her. And if they ever got into an argument or discussion politically on politics, goodness knows what would have happened. But when you played with someone music at that kind of level, with that sort of emotional intensity, what you what you're recognizing is, hey, this is a human being. Mm -hmm. I can no longer treat them like a thing. They're human. They've got they've got feelings. They grieve. They mourn. They cry. They dance with joy. All that coming out. At, in the music, help, I can no longer demonize them. Hmm. And I think that that just shows the enormous power of music to unite, which everyone knows, of course, and which sadly in the lockdown, uh, we're missing out on. Yeah. So music's exceptionally good at that. There's another thing music's particularly good at, that, and it just follows, and I mentioned a minute ago, is it helps us, this is gonna sound a bit new agey, but it's, but it's not, um, it's a way of, tuning in, you could say, or resonating with a wider cosmic order. Virtually every, um, I think it's with that, every philosophy of music that's ever been developed from ancient times right through to the present. Um, not, well, yes, okay, some don't push it that strongly, but um, it's a very, very common way of understanding music to see it as tapping into an order that is wider than us, that we did not make uh, the harmony of the spheres and all that. The fact that strings vibrate in a certain way and not others, is we can do nothing about. That's just the way it is. And if you're a musician, you can't ignore those things. So it's back to the doctrine of creation. The music is a way, you could say, in which you're, you're tuning, you're, you're recognizing something much, much wider than yourself, this uh, glorious order of creation. So that's music. What about the, like, the specifics of language? Language is also concerned with creating bonds. I think we must understand that as its basic purpose. Kevin Van Hooser is superb on this, if you ever read him. Um, of course, language is there for us to create bonds between each other, uh, between us and the, and the world around us, the physical world around us, and of course, between us and God. That's why God gave us language. But it has a very distinct power, among others, and that is it can name things, identify and distinguish things with precision and accuracy. And it, that in turn gives us the power to grasp things and move them around and push them together and make things. Um, uh, music is hopeless at that. You can't say this is a table in music. You can't name things with music. You can't refer or denote music to the same thing. There, sometimes people have tried, but usually it's not what's interesting about music. Mm. If I want to say that, if I want to indicate that there's a table here, I don't go to music. I just say, hey, here's a table. Uh, so music is pretty poor at denoting. Uh, 
it's it's very good at what's called connoting that is bringing all sorts of emotional connotations to things but it's very poor at pointing language is very strong at that and many of its terms will rely on its ability to point to things so to sum up common root common root in communication bodily communication uh, involving emotion socially uh, socially embedded but they have distinctive powers and we need to recognize the distinctive powers now of what we call music and language and rejoice in them that's that's the kind of gist of it that's not a, that's not a definition but it's changed the way I've, I've thought about a lot of things. And it certainly it's got away from this idea that music's a slightly embarrassing mm -hmm. language that hasn't grown up or an even worse theory that it's like the sort of bubbles in a bath that came out of language. You know, language is a serious business, but oh yes, it sort of has got nice tunes in it occasionally and we'll turn that into music. Mm -hmm. There's very little evidence for either of those. Yeah. Much yeah. more serious, much more serious business. And that's why of course it is universal. There isn't a single society we've ever heard of that, that, that does not know something like music and particularly singing. Mm -hmm. I uh, want to follow up right on that point, uh, especially about uh, music and language in the discipline of theology. But before we do that, hmm. there was a, a, a viewer who was wondering um, if there are recommended readings on the history of music and language. Yeah, great. Uh, like how would they find those? Yeah. Um, the best book by far, it's, it's some people argue about the, the details, but the basic thesis is superb. It's by Ian McGilchrist, and it's called The Master and His Emissary. It's about left brain, right brain things, but um, it's got a brilliant chapter there. I think it's just called Language and Music, or perhaps Music and Language. That summarizes the state of play in the research, at least up until about what? Five years ago, for but 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 it's very widely accepted. Uh, there's some there's some people working in Cambridge on this um, as I speak. It's very it's kind of cutting edge research. He's in touch with that, and he puts it puts the matter so beautifully and so clearly. Dare I say it? I've tried one or two things myself, but go there first. Ian Mc, Ian McGilchrist, the master and his emissary. Yeah. The master and his emissary. Thank you. And you, you do have some essays yourself as well. Um, and uh, maybe you can we can get to that after I just ask you even th this next question. Well, so, we want to talk about your book as well, Noah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so right, I've I've done a book that's uh, being released uh, this month on um, music musicality Absolutely. of preaching, uh, music and preaching, and how how they uh, how musical instincts can be used in preaching. Good. So, uh, and, and Dr. Begbie has written the forward to that, just to bring it all together. Absolutely, uh, in, indeed. I, I got a good fee for it, but it was, um, it was, it was fun to write. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so music and theology, you want to, yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> what, uh, in, when we do theology and when we I think know. about the discipline of theology, of course, there's a primacy to language. Yeah. And so how, how is your approach to how music and the arts factor in? Does music do theology um, or is, uh, is theology reserved for uh, God talk, which is a phrase that you've used in one of your essays? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, uh, there's a primacy given to words in theology. That, that's, not, that's not because we've got a thing about words. It's because God has. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that God has used the speech of human beings to, to communicate his very self and his purposes. Um, and that the, and the, the gospel is whatever else it is, and it is a lot of things, it is proclaimed. And something has to be said. And that, that's nothing to do with the Protestant hang up about words. It's just it's just the way the Christian faith is, and we shouldn't be we shouldn't be worried about that particularly, or or um, ashamed of it or diminish it. So there's a certain primacy to language. Yes, indeed. Um, as far as theology is concerned, I take it to be centrally, to put it very simply, thinking and speaking about God, and about all things in relation to God. So thinking and speaking about God and about all things in relation to God. Um, 
it is closely interlinked with, interlinked with a whole lot of other things. Uh, of course, the body and emotions and passions and prayer and worship and all the rest of it. But it's not reducible to those things, in my own view. It is primarily thinking and speaking about God and what the philosopher would call, therefore, a second order of discipline. I think I don't, at least that's the way I see it. Now, then the question is, what does music do then? It seems, if, to, again, to put it very simply, the, I think the core of it is this, that music can shape our thinking and speaking about God as we're attempting to be true to scripture. It can shape our thinking about speaking about God and shape them for the better. So when, for instance, okay, you go to worship, you sing a hymn, um, and afterwards you say, I don't think that music was quite reflecting the text. Say, let's imagine you say that. What, what you're doing then is you're saying that music was shaping the way I was thinking about God in ways that I thought were unhelpful. Uh, or it might be well, speaking about God, but you get the basic point. Um, scripture orients us to God, yes, indeed. But music has its own powers to help us read scripture more deeply and eventually think and speak about God, I hope, more faithfully. Now, the kind of example um, but I've, I've tried to explore these things, of course, in my own work. Uh, the Trinity would be a very obvious example there that I've, I'm increasingly convinced that many of the church's wrangles and struggles over the doctrine of the Trinity have been because we've over relied on the eye to do our thinking for us. And that if we could um, think more about the way we hear the world and the, wor the world we hear, things overlap in the same space but things remain distinct at the same time. Two sounds do not merge into something else or hide each other. They can be heard as distinct in the same oral space. And of course, if you add a third sound, then you have an extraordinary oral parable, enactment even, of a kind of space that's very close to Trinitarian space. When John, in John's gospel, writes of Jesus saying, um, the Father is in me, I'm in the Father, you know that, in one another language, that's very hard to visualize. It's extraordinarily easy to hear when two notes um, interpenetrate and resonate indeed in the same heard space. Now what's happening there is not that music's become the new criteria for all of theology, not at all. You're oriented to scripture. You're oriented to what scripture is trying to speak about and uh, I can catch you up into. And within that orientation, you say, how can music help us uh, not only experience that, well, that's important, but uh, also to think about that and speak about that more faithfully. You see, through music, the language of Trinitarian theology suddenly becomes more faithful to what scripture is trying to tell us. And so I, th I think music has an enormous contribution to make to theology that way. Now, I get criticized sometimes. So, Jeremy, does that mean the only value music has at first day is to help the theologian? Of course not. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, but it has, a, it has a very considerable part to play. And all this came out actually just from my practice of teaching doctrine, teaching theology in Cambridge week after week. I suddenly realized, hey, I'm thinking as a musician very often. And, do you know, when you think as a musician, some of these not only scriptural texts, but doctrinal texts begin to take off. <laughs> they become suddenly, I'm going to use a visual metaphor, transparent. They become suddenly alive in ways that I wouldn't have thought possible. Um, so that's what that's how I think music, music can help. You could say music can help us discover and articulate the gospel more profoundly. It can, of course, do exactly the opposite. Yeah. So can anything, um, yeah, but yeah. that's at least part of its possibility. Those listening to this who are also perhaps visual artists or uh, yeah. dramatists or or dancers, go for it. You will find the same with your media. Mm -hmm. Read scripture through that, and mm -hmm. see what happens. And you will find all sorts of texts probably suddenly come alive in a way you didn't expect. And then you, you thank God for that. <laughs>
you thank God. You're not ditching language in the process or saying language is a bad thing or scripture is a bad thing or we're going to forget about scripture and just become athletes and hold hands and sing songs. Um, you know, it's still, um, here's an example, sorry, I remember, but an, an example that really brought this home to me. The, um, oh gosh, it was about 20 years ago now. I was taking a, a, a weekend on worship in a parish church with a group of very inexperienced musicians. Uh, some had only been playing two or three weeks. And it was, it was the kind of orchestra, it was a, a band basically that, that you only get in the Christian church. I mean, two euphoniums and a couple of clarinets and an attitude trumpet and all, you know, nowhere else in Western civilization will you get that group of instruments. Um, and instead of just playing the music after we rehearsed some things, I gave them the text. Uh, it was the baptism of Jesus, uh, John. Um, and said, we're going to read this text as musicians and we're going to play it. Let's see what happens. And that was an extraordinary experience. They came out with all, they, they got right into the theology of this text without <laughs> saying a word, particularly the fascinating business of the way that the two ages, the old age and new age overlap in that text. And they were doing that sonically. Uh, John the Baptist, Jesus, as a little as a young flute player said, let's have the Jesus theme as the inversion of the John Baptist theme. And she did that on the spot. Um, they were reading that text like scholars. I mean, with a closeness of scholars. No one could say this is this is, I don't know, airy fairy, uh, you know, floating in the clouds, nothing to do with with scripture. Wow, they were they were doing Bible study, mm -hmm. but they were doing it as musicians. Mm -hmm. And they were allowing the music to bring forth the glories of the of this text. Um, I suggested to the church that we play this improvisation or version of it in the service the next day, but that was rejected on the because we couldn't tell them exactly how long it would last. <laughs> <laughs> There's something that you might like to think about. Um, and there, so I, think, no, I think music has got a lot to offer. Theology, and not least the theology of preaching, to come to your thing, though, you can tell, tell me much more than I could ever you on that. But I think that uh, you've done, ex you've done that particular book is an extraordinary thing, because you're basically doing a kind of homiletics or theology of preaching, but you're doing it in a musical way. You're allowing music to do its own kind of work in its own kind of ways, yeah. and not try to turn it into something else. Mm -hmm. well, and I think that's just so important, what you've said about... Um, how music works in God's purposes and how it works within the discipline of theology, which it necessarily has to be uh, linguistically focused yeah. or centered. Yeah. Of course. And yet at the same time, um, I'm, I'm seeing more and more uh, philosophers, theologians, uh, people talking about uh, the, uh, I think Esther Meek in her book, Loving to Know, mm -hmm. uses a phrase such as, um, epistemological captivity or something like yeah. that, you know, where yeah. we have this very flat uh, modernist Western enlightenment um, understanding of what knowledge itself. Not knowledge, precisely. And so you're, you're one of the uh, voices in the mix of calling us even to uh, a greater understanding of what knowledge is, what it entails to know something, how to know something and, um, you, you know, I've, I'm seeing books now about ritual knowledge. Um, yes. other way, you, you referenced uh, Kevin Van Hooser talking about scriptural interpretation through a dramatic lens. Uh, that's one of that's his. That's right. That's another uh, example. That's another example. So, no, I mean, uh, on the, the epistemology, you mentioned the love thing there, I mean, because yeah. of course, number speaking of an epistemology of love, uh, to get us out of the straitjacket of a very, what we think of as knowledge is very, very particular. Well, the accumulation of information or data, as if all that's what knowing was. Tom Wright's very good on this. His latest Gifford lectures, he's got extended section on knowledge and knowledge and love. And of course, again, when you read scripture in that light, I mean, the, John's gospel is about mm -hmm. the interweaving of knowledge and love, um, as, as is Paul as well. In, mm -hmm. To know God is to love God, to love God is to know. These are two inseparable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and, and in Paul, too, that, that marvelous passage where he ends with, even as I am fully known. Fully known, precisely. That's, yeah. the, very, that's the very verse that Tom quotes at the, the climax of that chapter. Yes. The important thing is not our knowledge of God, but God's knowledge of us, which is always a knowledge wrapped up in love. God never knows us without loving us. 
It's a, yes. it's a wonderful and liberating thought. Yes. Mm, amen. We could we could close on that one and and play uh, the altar call now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'll I'll keep going though. Uh, so it, this is a related question. You, at the end of theology, music, and time, this is twenty some years ago now. Uh, you wrote that um, music can challenge theology to to ask if it is prepared to integrate a performative mode into mm. its work. And so since that was a couple of decades ago now. Uh, I'm wondering, how do you think that the theology and the arts conversation has progressed since then? Are you seeing greater in integration of this idea of the performative mode? Gosh, that's so good. Yeah, it's. I'm stumped by that in a way, because it's very hard to generalize. I think generally, yes, generally. I think we're becoming more aware in the theology and arts dialogue that uh, if you're going to talk about music, you've got to play it and do it as well. Mm -hmm. Um, that if you're going to, if you're going to talk about prayer, you know, all these conferences on prayer that never pray, um, uh, dare I say conferences on worship, not at Calvin, but there are plenty of conferences on liturgy and worship where if God is not, not around, it appears, is no longer living uh, and no longer there for to be worshipped. So, yes, I think, I think things are better. I think um, I've tried, I suppose, in my own little way, when I'm teaching or speaking to move seamlessly into the musical so that you don't overhear something exotic that's going to illustrate what I'm saying. This is part of what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And even when I'm talking about music, uh, uh, it's sometimes just best to stop talking about that and just play it and they, and they get the point. So I think, I think the trouble is the biggest resistance to this is institutional resistance. And by that, I don't mean leaders of institutions are unimaginative, although there are some, uh, that that's not the, the point. I'm saying that the very structures of assessment, uh, theological education, the way we evaluate, the way we grade and all the rest of it is so locked into another system. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a systemic thing you're up against, uh, much more, I think, even now than, than a... Than a a, a philosophical or theological resistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I find, and the other thing is, if you're out there and you're wondering whether you should be integrating, whether it's music or the arts into, into theology or to Christian teaching or to the Sunday school class or whatever, don't don't try to theorize it or get too worried. Just do it. Yeah. Just do it. Yeah. And sometimes yes. you'll make a mess of it. You know, it's okay. God has had a lot of practice forgiving people for the last two thousand years. He'll pick you up, but sometimes it will, something extraordinary will happen and you will be surprised. Yeah. How people will suddenly get what you've been perhaps speaking about when you turn this into music or you play some music or whatever it is. Um, so in, just do it, just dare to do it and, yeah. and, and let, the, let the institutions then catch up. Yes, yeah. It's interesting because we've we've got this uh, teacher scholar grants program, which goes alongside of our uh, worshiping communities grants program for uh, vital worship. Um, and in this case, it's a research project primarily that the teacher scholar uh, vein is working on. Mm -hmm. But we've had to address this question. It's a newer uh, grant grant making program for us, and and we've had to even address this question of what uh, an appropriate you know quote unquote research or a project. Uh, would look like in different disciplines that are more performatively oriented, such as music. Absolutely. No, it's one of the most encouraging things about the Institute, mm. which, which I've been privileged to see develop over many years, um, is it, pre it precisely, it's theologically serious mm. and it doesn't denigrate scholarship mm -hmm. or, or hard thinking or any of those things at all. And yet it is performative in all the best senses as well. That, that's a pretty rare combination these days, but it does provoke, it does pro, um, present a challenge to, to some institutions, that way of doing things. And we, we just need to expect that because you, you're up against, gosh, hundreds, well, decades at least of, of history. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder if we can uh, get back to the, the setting of worship. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you, by the way, for taking those detours through theology and uh, the history of music and language with me. 
So uh, thinking again about worship, and especially for many Protestants, um, you know, there's this problem that you've named already, which is we can just be so word-centered, very cognitive, uh, not embodied, but very cognitive and word-centered. And so it's fair to say then um, for a lot of Protestants, because that's kind of our orientation, we struggle then to know there, of course, just like in theology, in worship itself, there is a legitimacy to say a centering worship around the word of God. Um, You know, there's a legitimacy to that. And yet, how then do we do justice to centering around the word of God while also uh, honoring uh, a, a nonverbal medium such as music? Mm. Well, I've tried to give some kind of indications of that. Um, and and the, the quick answer is just good practice. Mm. Uh, again, just do it. Um, yes, of course, there are hundreds of ways of integrating uh, an art form like music or nonverbal art form, like let's say um, visual depiction or whatever. Yes, of course, and, and, and your institute has uh, pioneered indeed some of those as well as provided resources galore for people working in those areas. I think I'd also want to say though, that and this relates to your preaching thing, the words that the church does use, hmm. uh, let's, let's just, let's, um, let's craft them a little bit more artistically. Mm-hmm. Let's be much more aware of the in, in nuances of words, the enormous um, con- connotations that flood out of carefully crafted metaphors. Um, if we if we soak ourselves in scriptures, then, then we'll find that going on all the time. Mm-hmm. And so, we must, again, careful not to denigrate or caricature language as, as an essentially mental operation that has its highest form in statements or something like that. No, no, language takes many forms. And uh, if we can develop particularly metaphorical, figurative language, in a, resp- a scripturally responsible way mm-hmm. and become word crafters, so careful word crafters, that itself will begin to break down some of these, these mm-hmm. barriers. Mm-hmm. So I think that, yeah, it's along those lines that the, the whole act of worship, uh, sometimes I've, I've been to worship where you've got this fantastic bit of, I don't know, drama, it could be, or magnificent visual display or whatever. And then someone comes on and just sort of, chats banally and i think i think it's good to chat in a banal way from time to time but in a way you think that you could have cared more about how to come out of that experience of whatever it was music or poetry or whatever you could have crafted that much more carefully uh, to lead us and you would be you would be modeling something about uh, about language in the process by the way there's a great book i'm reading at the moment who's title escapes my mind, is it John McWhorter, if I haven't got the right, right name, African-American writer. Um, this is, and this is one of his points. We seem to have, and it's not a class thing, it's not about elitism, but we seem to have lost the ability to craft words in a, uh, in a metaphorically rich and evocative way. Mm. Our language is flatter and flatter and flatter for all sorts of reasons. Mm. I'm afraid that happens in the church as well. It should not be happening in church, not if we're students of scripture, Mm -hmm. where language is hardly ever flat, if you think about it. Yeah. (laughs) Hardly ever dull. Right. It it can be infuriating and confusing and all sorts of other things, but there are very few dull parts in the the scripture. (laughs) Yes, yes. Well, I just find it fascinating that you've noticed, especially this connection between um, what happens around preaching in worship Mm. and then how preaching enters that moment and exits it. Um, It it actually just so happens that when I try to take what I've done, primarily writing to uh, preachers uh, about musical instincts and and how those Mm. might influence our preaching, Uh, One of the connections that I'm finding, especially with scholars of of worship more generally, uh, or worship leaders, is this idea of um, of that entry and that exit um, into uh, preaching and uh, into the other actions and uh, parts, uh, the liturgical parts of, of our worship services. And um, 
for me, I just find it fascinating. Um, it's just it's still a question that I've been exploring uh, about this, the skill with which uh, a preacher is able to match the energy of that moment and uh, the energy of maybe even, um, for instance, the genre of the worship music uh, that uh, happens around the preaching moment. Yes, and, yes. and how to, uh, like you have uh, so uh, brilliantly sort of identified, not let that moment, let not let all the air go out of that moment, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. but uh, but per, to preserve what's been building. Yes, and yes. Um, and there's almost a, a way in which it's the, the moment itself can continue to have uh, a holiness about it. Yeah. I, you know, I don't want to use uh, the two uh, extraordinary sure. it's uh, a kind of resonance. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. And um, and I'm, I've been finding um, that uh, there may be, or at least still is a question of mine, uh, there may be a connection with some of the, the really uh, big names in, in contemporary praise and worship and uh, the skill with which the preachers in those worship services are able to enter yep. that moment and re uh, re um, preserve that energy um, and that sound. Couldn't agree. Yeah, you put it much more eloquently than I could. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and and I'm glad you mentioned that in the so-called kind of contemporary worship, they, they're often much, much more sensitive mm -hmm. to the atmosphere and flow and mood and ambiance of, of an occasion and how to finish something mm -hmm. that doesn't just, as it were, perpendicularly cut it off. Um, uh, much more than many so-called liturgical traditions. In, uh, I quite often go up, up the road here's King's College Chapel, and when it's open, I, I quite often go there for a, an evening service. And at least the previous director of music, Stephen Cleaver, who's, who's passed on now, when it came to the reading, the reading happened, and then the choir would sing an anthem afterwards, every, every Saturday. And I'd always noticed the reading would happen, and he would just sit there, because he gave the signal when you stand to the choir. He would sit there for anything up to half a minute, and then he would just slowly stand up or whatever. So it would just let the reading have its effect. And the same with the music, of course, the same with the music. And when it came to a sermon, and uh, uh, yeah, for virtually every sermon that I've heard there, the so preacher will finish, they'll sit down, and then there's a good 10 to 15 seconds. Yeah, and if that's been a really good sermon, that's that's terrific. <laughs> but oh, I've been to some others where it's yeah, absolutely practically in heaven. And someone said, now we're gonna sing this hymn, or now we're gonna say this creed. Mm. And uh, that's that's I think you use the phrase musical instinct. Mm. I mean, if, if you if you're a musician of any sort, you just don't do that. Mm -hmm. That's of course a very good example of of something speaking in silence, isn't it? Yes. Silence yes. is not empty. It, yeah. it has a reson as a kind of fullness to it. Uh, and, and music is very good at generating that kind of silence, that kind of silence. And a good preacher is also good at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when I started, started preaching, I asked a, a lay person in the congregation to, to be very critical. He said, well, Jeremy, I think you could stop every now and then. When you ask a, a really big question, just let the question sit with us for, for at least five seconds, please. Because you just dash on because you're frightened of losing the concentration of the congregation and he was dead right he was mm -hmm. dead right. yeah it takes a lot of courage to stop yes but it's well worth it <laughs> yeah i uh i think it was evans crawford who uh talked about uh the african-american preacher howard thurman uh, yes. by saying uh, about thurman that nobody made use of the pause better than thurman Roman, exactly yeah oh uh, i mean if i I've, I've, yes and I deliberately, when I'm in Los Angeles, I go when I can to to, to African American churches. And again, there's this is extraordinary sense of timing, yes. and of um, and of using pauses and all these things, which are, which you used to come back to your thing of musical instincts, or actually, I think they're instincts way back in that prim primordial music language. I think that's where they come from ultimately, and that they're common actually to both music and language. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're tapping into something very deep there, I think. Yeah, ooh, that's good. I, I wanna just let our viewers know that we do have a few minutes if there are uh, any questions Please. that uh, 
some people want to type into the the question and answer uh, panel. Of course. And um, I'm, and I'm uh, just I'm I'm noticing some connections that are being made uh, to some of the things that we have been saying. Uh, I wonder if there are any while uh, we wait to see if there are any more uh, questions that might get typed in. Um, what are some of the just a really practical uh, suggestions that you might have for a pastor or a worship leader? We've talked uh, sure. just now about several things. Are there any things that you might have to add? Uh, be able to read your book. I mean, I'm serious about that. I mean, definitely that. Um, oh, do come to my course in a year's time. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry. Uh, more seriously, I think t uh, musicians speak to pastors and vice versa. I mean, actually speak and enjoy each other's company. I'm sure that goes on much more in the States than it does here, but boy, it doesn't happen here much, I can tell you. Mm. Uh, and that, that's a great sadness to me. That's why people don't really understand each other very well. Mm. I think it's very important to talk about the hymns and songs or musical items that you've had in a service. Mm. And ask, well, what happened? Or was that appropriate? Or did it work? Mm -hmm. Did the music distort the text? Because mm. that can happen. Mm -hmm. Did the music get in the way in some sense? It's another very good question to ask. Uh, the way it was, not just the way it was performed, but just the very type of music that it was. Did it eclipse the text such that it became actually much more important than the text? Mm -hmm. Another thing, can music, could, did the music or could music suggest things that are not spelled out in the text, but which are appropriate to the text? An example comes to mind, John Bell, I think is a setting of one of the the, the um, pleading, not quite a lament, but it's one of these pleading psalms when, when the psalmist is, is pleading to God for mercy and for grace. And he said it to the tune Amazing Grace, mm -hmm. which is a very, very wise thing. So what he's doing, he's setting the plea in the context of grace provided by the music. So the music, so to speak, is answering the word. Now, that's not spelled out in the text, but it's wonderfully true to the text. Mm -hmm. And it gives a wider theological view to that text. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there are other dimensions of the text that have not been touched on by the music. Mm -hmm. A great deal of music in our churches these days, it seems to me, is a very, very narrow bandwidth, uh, particularly emotionally, but I mean, in terms of, of style. And, if you, and I would take every worship leader, if I could, and every music, church music composer, if I could, to work with a very good film composer. Mm. And th there we learn the multiple, multiple musical languages and vocabularies and, and musical nuances that they know just how uh, to use to do justice to the multiple, multiple emotional colors or whatever it is of the film that they're setting music to. Hmm. Uh, sadness, with a lot, of, uh, a lot of us church musicians tend to think, well, there's happy, there's sad, and there's a few things in between. Uh, we can do better than that, I think, particularly if we're talking about a scriptural text. This is the word of God, after all. I mean, come on now. I think we can do, I think sometimes we can do a bit better. Mm. That is, uh, uh, there are so many ways that we could, we could build on those suggestions. I appreciate them so much. Uh, I, I think there's a lot there uh, that should set help, uh, people in helpful directions. There's been a couple of questions that uh, I, I'm hoping we can just take one moment to see if we can answer. Um, what about pastors in seminaries who don't really have great musical gifts? Um, mm. How do you help them uh, see the integration of worship and preaching um, with music? Um, but, um, by encouraging to speak to musicians mm. and learn from musicians mm. and vice versa. Mm -hmm more gatherings and conferences we can have where there's actual communication between the better. Mm -hmm. uh, and another thing is that pastors who call themselves unmusical or not usually turn out to be actually hmm. intuitively very in touch with music. I've mm -hmm. spoken at many, many clergy conferences and uh, often they come, I'm very touched, they come up afterwards and said, you know, what all you're doing, Jeremy, is you're just giving me words to express what I think I already know. And so that now I can communicate with my music people more fully because I can, un I can understand it. I can give words to what I knew intuitively. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And, and that, that I think applies to many pastors. Mm-hmm. You know, the old business, I'm not musical, so often just means I was told I was unmusical when I was 10. Mm-hmm. I was cut out of the choir or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, turns out, it turns out there's nothing of the sort and that they have actually an intuitive sense of what is right and wrong musically um, that just needs a heck of a lot of developing and you need to give them language to articulate that. Yeah. Well, and I love this idea and I think this is so important to for uh, musicians and uh, pastors or preachers whose main role is not in music um, to help each other to understand how do you look at the world? How do you That's exactly how do you get inside a, a biblical text and how, both of them have so much to learn. Absolutely. Uh. I mean, one's got to be honest in, again, maybe more in this country, but there are many church musicians who struggle with the basics of the faith. And and, and we've got to be able to help each other on this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've seen some wonderful things happen with, with pastors and indeed lay people in the congregation working with musicians mm-hmm. and suddenly giving them far, I mean, extraordinary depth to what they're doing that they never had before because they grow in faith. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We've had some really great questions come in. We could talk for another hour. I wonder if I could ask you one final question about genre. So oh a lot of your music uh, writing, you, you talk about J.S. Bach, uh, yeah, yeah, some yeah. things in Western classical music. Um, do you do you think that the things that we've been talking about with, with music and language um, that there is any differences with what you would say if you were thinking in terms of a more um, uh, yeah. modern worship or contemporary Christian worship uh, context, or uh, do there uh, are there just things that apply more broadly? I think, I hope that uh, 80% of what I've said would apply to Henry genre. And all that stuff about the evolution of music, about music and text or whatever would apply whatever the style of music. Um, so that's certainly what I hope and what I've, although I'm trained in the classical tradition, um, I've worked with musicians of, of, across most genres over, over many years. Um, I don't try to pretend to be what I'm not. So I'm trained in a particular tradition. I need to be very aware of that and of my own particularity and situation. Mm-hmm. But I do believe there are extraordinary things that evolutionists and anthropologists and psychologists and others are discovering about music that's actually the case, sure, in different ways, but across the board. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But, so I'm acutely, acute, acutely aware of that. Uh, one of the things, when I say teach theology and music at, uh, at Duke, one of the great joys of that is that the, the students, for instance, I've got a student working on hip hop at the moment. And that's been a, that's been a huge learning thing for me. And I, I absolutely loved it. And I found all sorts of connections between the things I've been trying to say and what's been going on in the hip hop world over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, but by the same token, uh, there's a woman in that class, very, very highly educated woman, uh, at least one or two degrees, had never heard of Bach, for instance, never heard of J.S. Bach. Mm. I was suddenly fascinated by this figure and why he was so different and what, what, what he was doing with sound and melodies and all the rest of it. Mm. That, that, both of those, both of those crossovers give me great hope. Mm-hmm. Uh, rather than just to stick in our cultural silos and, uh, and yeah. hurl rocks at each other every now and then. That's not the way to go. Uh, roots down, walls down, the phrase I use quite often. Yeah. Have your roots, know what, you, what you're trained in, don't apologize for it, but don't pretend it's the only show in town. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jeremy, I, I think that's a really great word to end on. I thank you so much for the time that you've spent here. And uh, thank you to our viewers for joining us. Um, there's uh, many lectures and, and books and writings that you can find of Dr. Begbie's online. And uh, we're so happy that uh, you have uh, shared this time with us in, in conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute delight.